What do you think our souls owe to ancient myths? Well, the ancient myths were designed to put the mind, the mental system, into accord with this body system, with this inheritance A harmony? of the body, to harmonize. The mind can ramble off in strange ways and want things that the body does not want. And uh, the myths and rites were means to put the mind in accord with the body and the way of life in accord with the way that nature dictates. So in a way, these old stories live in us. They do indeed. And uh, the uh, stages of a human development are the same today as they were in the ancient times. And the problem of a child brought up in a world of uh, discipline, of obedience, and of his dependency on others has to be transcended when one comes to maturity so that you are living now not in dependency but with self-responsible authority. And the problem of the transition from childhood to maturity and then from maturity and full capacity to losing those powers and acquiescing in the natural course of, uh, you might say, the autumn time of life and the passage away. Myths are there to help us go with it, accept nature's way and not hold to something else. The stories are sort of, to me, like messages in a bottle from shores someone else has visited first. Yes, and you're visiting those shores now. And these myths tell me how others have made the passage? and how I can make the path. And, and also what the beauties are of the way. Uh, I feel this now moving into my own last years, you know. The, the myths help me to go with it. What kind of myth? Give me a, a one that has actually helped you. Well, the uh, tradition in India, for instance, of actually changing your whole way of dress uh, even changing your name as you pass from one stage to another. Uh, when I um, retired from teaching, I, I knew that I had to create a new life, a new way of life, and uh, I changed my manner of, uh, of uh, thinking about my life, just in terms of that uh, notion of moving out of the sphere of achievement into the sphere of enjoyment and appreciation and uh, re relaxing into the wonder of it all. And then there is that final passage through the dark gate? That, well, that's no problem at all. The problem in middle life, when the body has reached its climax of power and begins to lose it, is to identify yourself not with the body which is falling away, but with the consciousness of which it is a vehicle. And when you can do that, and this is something I learned from my myths, what am I? Am I the, uh, the bulb that carries the light, or am I the light of which the bulb is a vehicle? And this body is a vehicle of consciousness. And if you can identify with the consciousness, you can watch this thing go like an old car. There goes the fender, there goes this. But that's expectable, you know? And then gradually, the whole thing drops off and consciousness rejoins consciousness. I mean, that's, it's no longer in this particular environment. And the myths, the stories have, have brought this consciousness. Well, I live with these myths and they tell me to do this all the time. And, uh, this is the problem which can be then metaphorically understood as identifying with the Christ in you. And uh, the Christ in you doesn't die. The Christ in you survives death and resurrects. Or it can be with Shiva, Shiva hung, I am Shiva. And this is the great meditation of the, of the, the yogis in the Himalayas. And uh, one doesn't have even to have a metaphorical image like that if one uh, has a mind that's willing to just relax and uh, identify itself with that which moves it.